Welcome back to part three of our rapid review of ECGs, a pre-recorded webinar that's part of our Picmonic lecture series. So if you're here, you've already learned the 10 Picmonics from part one and part two of this series, which is linked as a playlist in the summary below. Go learn those topics now with your Picmonic Premium membership. And then let's go on to the final part of this ECG rapid review. Now, let's talk about um, uh, some tachy dysrhythmias, rhythms that basically, lots of different rhythms that are too fast. Now, these are some of the ones that people have trouble with. Because sinus tachycardia itself is a toughie. Um, and I'm surprised somebody didn't didn't point this out, but um, sinus tachycardia itself is is difficult. And the point is, um, you know, it only in this example it says 101 to 180 beats. Now that doesn't mean after 180 it's not sinus tachycardia, but we have other names for it. That's right. So let's talk about these um, these two fast rhythms. Let me just scoot back. Stitch is sitting on my lap. He's a pain in the butt today. Um, so uh, first off, first one I want to talk about. So we're talking about things that are too fast. We're going to talk about um, uh, tachy dysrhythmias. So if we talk about tachy dysrhythmias, we can talk about um, uh, ones that are too fast, like supraventricular tachycardia. If we're talking about tachycardia, right? So what does supraventricular tachycardia mean? Well, that means that the um, the heart the um, the electrical activity I can't even talk today all of a sudden. The electrical activity arises um, above the ventricles. That means the electrical activity rises above the ventricles and um, is uh, supraventricular. So what happens is it causes a, ta a tachycardia, and there's a couple different kinds. I'm not going to talk about each one of them, but essentially what happens most commonly is either overexcitation of the SA node from things like caffeine um, and um, you know uh, nicotine, um, stress, lots of different things. There's, but the big one, you know, caffeine is a huge trigger for what we call supraventricular tachycardia or SVT. Um, and of course, you know, whenever we look at treating rhythms um, and treating any type of rhythm itself, what we need to know is, is the patient symptomatic? I mean, anytime we have a uh, ECG uh, abnormality, so even sinus bradycardia, we, may, we don't have to treat sinus bradycardia unless it's symptomatic because we know athletes which i'm not in the athlete category they have big strong hearts so their hearts beat slower they're, they're normally bradycardic and of course um would be normally slow get down stitch you're gonna have to sit down uh, they're gonna be normally slow and then of course um you don't have to treat them you don't just start giving atropine to everyone because they have a slow heart rate um because it may be normal so we treat symptomatic patients same with svt uh so let's look at a couple of these a couple of there's also a way where we have uh, before I forget, uh, malt re-entry uh, SVT. So it's essentially can be caused by um, other accessory pathways that basically, here's a good example right here in this one. So atrial tachycardia, which we have a slide on, and then um, just re-excitation of that AV node causing, um, causing uh, overstimulation. So I love this term, uh, paroxysmal. Paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Wow, what a fun word, right? Say that 10 times fast paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, or PSVT or SVT. PSVT means paroxysmal. That means that it's, um, that means it's um, eh, transient, right? Just like my thought right at the moment. It's transient. It was there and then I lost it. Um, Nicole on, on YouTube thinks um, Stitch is drunk. He may, he may be drunk. I don't know. Um, so paroxysmal means that it comes on and it goes away. So how do we check this? And look at this rhythm. Most of you on the rhythms, if, you, if you're not really comfortable with ECGs, you're going to look at this one. You're like, I have no idea what's going on. But anytime you're looking at a rhythm, if you get one that you just really can't tell and you're able to get a longer portion of a rhythm, uh, bigger, bigger section, that's great. That's what you should do because what you want to do is see what was happening. Like things are chugging along great. So look at this rhythm here. This, this rhythm is chugging along great. If I literally, if you took your hand and you covered up if you covered up this section of your, you know, from here back, and you looked at just this rhythm and imagine you did that same thing for six seconds, everything's great. I mean, it's a great rhythm. So, you know, that, that's normal. But what happens is when we, when we look at the, the, you know, the steps, what's the rate here? So Jack's an overachiever and apparently already counted 15 across here. So I'm just going to believe you. 
So that rate right now, and during this six seconds, was about 150 beats a minute. Um, and uh, that's okay. That's way too fast. But is, the, is it regular? Is what's going on here regular? Is what's happening here regular? Well, I'm going to get my beautiful thumbs, and I put them up there, and I look, and I'm like, wow, I got a big space. So right here, oh, there we go. There's my red pointer. I got a big space. I got another space the same. Then it gets smaller, smaller. But then it's just literally just tiny space. <coughs> hey. <coughs> Come here. Oh. Yeah. Stitch, Stitch is definitely ha He's having a day. He's, he's, he's not, ha not having the best day. He's, he's not happy. So then I have um, a tiny space, tiny space, tiny space, tiny space, tiny space, tiny space, right across here. That's and that's absolutely right. So it gets, but it's regular in the middle, but it's too fast. If you just took this section and you multiplied it times two, then you've got a way really fast rate, right? But then what happens? Well, then somewhere right along this space, it gets normal again, and it's normal. Here it looks just like a, the same as it did before. So it was doing something normal. It did some craziness in the middle, and then it just got back normal again. We see this again when we're going to talk about a ventricular rate. But what happens is it was doing great, then it got to just it, it got drunk here in the middle, and then again it did crazy stuff. It's going to regret, and then it went back to. I wasn't talking about Eustich. That was one of the Eustich people, not me. Um, and uh, then it goes back to being normal again. But that's the point. There's just this madness in the middle, and that's what we call paroxysm. Um, <laughs> sorry, Francis. Um, sometimes. Sometimes Stitch goes a little, uh, a little crazy. I don't, I don't know why. I, I think he has Tourette's. I'm mean, just going to be honest. I, I can always tell when he's about to do it. That's why I pulled him up here because he's just like looking around like he's just about ready to yell. Um, <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay. So um, as we look here, uh, this is why we call it paroxysmal. It's normal. It comes and then it goes away. So uh, before I talk about that, what somebody already mentioned it once, but when we talk about uh, SVT, it's really important to know that SVT, paroxys paroxysmal SVT, anything that's randomly coming and going, is usually a sign for something that's going to come and stay and be very problematic. This is the same when you think about TIAs, transient ischemic attacks. TIAs, they come and they go and they come and they go, and you're all fine until you get the big one, right? And then it doesn't go away. It's the same with PSVT. If you're somebody who is drinking caffeine, like me, and you're, you know, uh, doing crazy stuff, like me, and what happens is then you, you have an SVT, luckily I don't have PSVT, but then you end up, um, you know, you have bouts of PSVT, what happens is eventually you go into SVT and your body's not able to convert. Um, anytime we go to an irregular rhythm to a normal rhythm, we call that conversion, your body's not able to convert back to a regular normal sinus rate. Stitch is giving me like the porno look right now. I don't know what this deal is. Um, but the point is, um, it, what happens is then eventually you're in sustained SVT. And those patients, you can't stay in SVT for very long. Um, some patients can. I mean, yes, they have runs of SVT and they're in SVT for a long time and, and they, you know, then they have to be treated. But what's the drug we need to give for SVT? This is really high yield. You got to know this drug. What's the drug? Uh, somebody already said earlier, I think. Uh, that's right. Um, so you've got to give um, adenosine. Um, you've got to give adenosine for sustained SVT. Adenosine uh, interrupts the, the channels in the heart and essentially um, stops the ability for the heart to contract electrically temporarily. And then what happens is um, it basically just restarts. It's the funnest drug to give ever. If you get to do it, um, I recommend getting to see it because you just see a patient at least usually for a second on your flatline. And it's the only medication really that you need to give as rapidly as possible because adenosine only has a half-life of just seconds. So it comes, it's there, and it's gone, just like my sex life. Anyway, that's the one bad joke I have today. So another one um, I want to talk about, I talked about what happens, how do we know that things are sinus, right? How do we know that things are sinus? Well, we know they're sinus because we've got those beautiful wonderful P waves, right? They're right there before every QRS. And what do we call something when there's no P wave? We call that a junctional rhythm. And a junctional rhythm happens whenever we have um, a rhythm that uh, um, doesn't have a P wave that's originating, originating from below the SA node, usually in the AV node or the uh, atrioventricular junction. 
So if I look at this rhythm, what's the rate down here? So let's follow the same pattern. Let's not skip ahead. One, two, three, four, five, six, 12. I got 12. I hope it's 12. So, um, so I've got 12 here. Um, so at rate of 12, so that's um, 120. So 120 or so. I mean, that's estimated, yes. But it's fast. That's the point, so tachycardia. So then when we look at the rhythm, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you didn't already look, it's beautiful. It's regular all the way across. The R to R's and the P to P. Oh, oh, well, the R to R's are great, right? So the R to R's, regular. And then you look at the next one. You look down and you say the P waves. Is there a P wave there before every QRS? Mm, no. There's no P wave. What's this? There's no P. That's not the P. That's that's over here. So we're 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 looking at PQRST, PQRST, and then just some madness down here, right? It's not. Um, it's actually the P wave is actually occurring. That's this is actually the P wave down here. But when you when you look at these, so many people get confused and they get hung up, right? You get hung up and you get confused, like, well, which one's the P? What you should be able to do is identify the QRS, right? If you identify the QRS, then you know that the, the P should be right before it and the T should be after it, right? So you just have to kind of, um, sometimes it requires a little bit of guesswork, but you just end up getting the hang of it, of just understanding that you've got, the, well, there should be a P wave right here causing this. Maybe you would say that little notches. No. So there's the QRS. And then remember, coming back ab above the isometric line, T. Here's our T wave. So this um, this is just a PQRS T. This is actually a hidden P wave down here in at the same time of the S. That's really bad. Um, so then we got a PQRS T, but there's no P waves. There's no P before the QRS. That's all you got to know. Before the QRS, is there a P? Is it upright and is it visible? No. Um, so then if it's not there, then that means it's a junctional rhythm. The rhythm's originating from the AV, AV node. So that's a PQRS T. That's how we know. PR interval, there is no PR interval, so it doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to um, uh, you don't have to calculate that because you can't do it. QRS usually is always fine, but you still do it. Um, the widened QRS there's only one box between all those, which means it's 0 0.04 seconds. Beautiful. Now, here I just said this again, just because I, I like to harp on it. Junctional rhythms, um, you know, just think about that. That junctional rhythm means it happens at the junction or below the junction, um, and that's what's important. That's why we call sinus rhythms sinus. Now let's talk about uh, some fun um, fun arrhythmias here. These are fun. Um, when we talk about um, the irregularities, the weird ones, these are ones that are hard. Um, these are ones that are so hard um, to really get down because they're they never appear the same way. You're going to get a rhythm and it's going to look different, uh, but you just follow the process and you'll get it. So let's look at atrial flutter here. What's the rate here? What is the rate? about eight right the ventricular rate is about 80 ventricular rate because the qrs is the ventricular rate well kendall you just said all you have to do is count the qrs complexes to get the rate yeah i did but now we're making it harder that's the whole point um so you know that the p waves themselves the p waves are essentially um atrial depolarization which should Ideally, if electric, the electrical activity is connected to the muscle tissue and working in harmony, every time a P wave happens, that's atrial depolarization. So then we can tell, we can count P waves to count the amount of atrial depolarization or the atrial rate. So what's the atrial rate here? Well, you could just literally count all the way across again and then multiply by 30, right? Um, but um, the uh, what you want to do is you want to see how many Q, how many there are to each QRS complex. How many, it's called, we, we call it the, um, uh, how many there are to each one. So it's like a one, three to one, a two to one, a four to one. So there are these little weird waves. What are these? These are really weird. Well, you see how these look almost like shark teeth, like a shark tooth or a saw, like a, if you ever use a saw. I'm from West Virginia, so I've seen lots of saws. Um, so um, the uh, important thing here is, um, the um, knowing that these rate right it looks like a sawtooth they're called flutter waves now you can, there isn't there isn't much in with ecgs that you can just memorize but every time you see um, one qrs complex and this little boop, 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 all the way across in beautiful harmony those are almost always sawtooth waves they're called flutter waves and when you see those 
These are essentially not P waves, but what happens is these are atrial depolarization. And you can see how many there are to each QRS complex, one, two, three. So there's about, th no, there's actually, well, there's three or four to each QRS. So you can see that that atrial rate's much faster than the um, ventricular rate. So when you look at the rhythm, is this rhythm regular or irregular? Well, if it's regular, that means there's one P before every QRS. The R to R's and the P to P's are um, a one-to-one -one ratio, and it's correct. So it's an irregular rate. And this is where it gets confusing. Is it doing the same thing over and over? Is it regularly irregular? Or is it doing literally there's no pattern whatsoever? Well, if I folded this into an origami set and like, you know, took it and cut it and laid them all over top of each other, it's doing the same thing over and over and over. People would be very cautious to call this regular. Well, it's irregular, but it's regularly irregular. It's doing the same thing wrong over and over and over again. So that's regularly irregular. That's right. Um, it's always weird for me when I see, I'm so used to like our go to webinar stuff and other things and it, it has like a name on there and uh, whatever it has, whatever you type in. And then YouTube, it shows up who, whatever the weird name is when you signed up. So, um, it just, it's funny for me, uh, with some of people's names, uh, duck butt. So anyway, um, you can see that this is irregularly irregular. P waves, well, you can't really tell that they're there, but those are those characteristic sawtooth waves, flutter waves. So that's why we call this atrial flutter. And of course, this can be very fast. I mean, you can have way, way crazy rates. What's wrong with all of these atrial arrhythmias? The atrial arrhythmias have problems because what happens is, if the, when you know um, when, um, when the, ventric the ventricles uh, or the atria relax, what happens when that happens? Well, they fill with blood. If the atria contract and contract and contract and contract and contract and contract really fast, they never slow down to catch a breath and fill with blood to be able to pump blood into the ventricles. So what happens is they, they're just going at a fast rate, right? And I can't, I can't do this at the, at the right speed and correlation. But the point is the atria never stop contracting at this fast rate, so the ventricles are able, never able to actually, the, the atria are never able to fill completely with blood, so then they can't pump enough blood to the, to, the, um, to the ventricles. And then, of course, you have decreased cardiac output, which then just further exacerbates the problem. Here's a couple of examples of flutter waves. And this is important because this is one that I feel like you can try to identify very easy. But the waves always kind of look like this sawtooth pattern. These are not pointy waves like the last one, but they are very characteristically, they're literally flutter waves. They're all the way across the board. Here's a two to one ratio. So there's two to one. Here's a three and then four to one. So four to one ratio. So four to one ratio. So you can kind of see the difference there and how the cardiac output is different and um, how, it, um, uh, how you'd have problems with cardiac output if you had four to one versus two to one. And that's absolutely right, because you would have a lot decreased blood flow. Now, the most uh, high yield one that you absolutely have got to be able to identify, and I feel like it's the one curveball that comes out of nowhere um, that so many people have trouble with, um, is, uh, is atrial fibrillation. So how do we identify atrial fibrillation? How do we identify atrial fibrillation? How do we how do we identify atrial fib? Well, let's look at the rate. Follow the exact same process. Don't skip ahead. So how many there? There's a QRS right here, by the way, right behind this little atrial heart alarm clock, um, who's um, who's freaking out for fibrillation. So how many how many? What's the speed here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, right? Sorry. So there's nine. So the the, um, the ventricular rate's about ninety. Now, okay, let's just go with that for now. What's the rhythm? What's the rhythm? Well, get your beautiful thumbs out and take a look. Well, it's wide, it's wide, then it's short, then it's wider, then it's shorter, then it's wide, then it's really short, then it's wider, then it's really wide. It's not doing the same thing. There's no, no distance between any of these is the same. Well, why would that distance be changing? Well, what causes the QRS complex to fire? The QRS, the QRS complex, the QRS complex fires because of um, uh, an atrial impulse, right? The firing from the SA node goes down to the AV junction, then bam, causes the, the, the QRS complex to fire, the atrial depolarization. So is this regular or irregular? Well, it's irregular, right? So if it's irregular, then um, is it irregularly regular? 
uh, regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? Well, there's no discernible pattern. Um, there's no discernible pattern whatsoever. And if you tried to go ahead and try to find the P to P, you can't. You can't find the P to P because where are the P waves? Well, here's where you, you have the difference between what we would call junction rhythm and fibrillation. Fibrillation, fibrillatory waves are just imagine quivering, right? Quivering, 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 fire, quivering, 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 fire, quivering, fire, quivering, fire. It's like, it's really just like being, um, being, uh, uh, electrocuted, I guess, you know, or, or tased at just a random interval because you're like freaking out and then you, you just fire, fire, uh, but it's no pattern to it whatsoever. And that's exactly what fibrillatory waves are. So where's the P wave? Well, um, let's just start right here. So that, that might be a P wave. No QRST, no P wave, QRST. There's a P wave right there, right? And um, QRST, nothing, QRST, QRST. T, Q, R, S, T, nothing. There's no P waves. There's no discernible P waves. And um, you can tell that it, it's getting regular all over the place. Uh, and that's how we can tell that this is irregularly irregular. And every time you get an irregularly irregular rhythm and you have Q, R, S complexes that are changing distance over time, it's very likely that it's atrial fibrillation. Um, unless you don't have a decent, if you have wide QRS complexes, that's obviously a much more serious problem. But that's where you should always have on the tip of your tongue atrial fibrillation because you're always going to get this thrown at you because it's so common um, as people age and they end up with um, uh, atrial, you know, atrial, atrial fib. What's the big problem with it? We worry about because the atria are just quivering and the ventricles are contracting and the atria are quivering and contract and then randomly and they're not working in unison. That means again, the blood flow from the atria are not going to the ventricles, and if the ventricles aren't able to fill, then it's not going out to the rest of the body. That's absolutely right. So um, what what do we do for this? Well, there's lots of things we can do for atrial fibrillation, but you got to worry about the uh, long-term problems because you can develop blood clots in the um, right atria, in the atrium, and those can travel out to the body and cause strokes and other problems, um, and um, that's really uh, the big worry with, uh, with AFib. So they're probably going to be put on coagulation therapy. Um, and of course, we can um, uh, cardiovert those patients as well. We can give them medications to help slow their heart rate down, calcium channel blockers like um, diltiazem or cardizem, that's right. So here's a good example, just a little a weird one um, that sometimes, I just want to mention this because I hear it all the time, um, atria, atrial fibrillation with RVR. You've probably heard that. I remember when I heard that the first time, I didn't know what the heck um, I didn't, I didn't know what the heck that was. It means it's a rapid ventricular response. That means essentially the atria were, were misfiring and fibrillating. And what happened was at some point, those eight, the ventricle, ventricles um, got a rapid ventricular response and started beating at a super fast rate. So it's a very high ventricular tachycardia that's very irregular. And this is very difficult to determine the difference between rapid uh, atrial fib with RVR versus super ventricular tachycardia. It's very difficult to distinguish, and that's why you need to get a 12 lead to be able to get the difference. Um, and that's definitely um, uh, definitely uh, a thing. Um, doo, 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 doo. Yeah, so uh, we'll move on. So let's talk about the cardiac arrest algorithms here, just, um, just so we can go over these before we finish up. So monomorphic VTAC. Now, first off, there's monomorphic and monomorphic, rather, and polymorphic. Mono means one. Morphic means changes. So one change, ventricular tachycardia. So it's going to look like the same every time. So first off, what's the rate here? Well, I can tell you that these are giant QRS complexes. And this every time you see something like this, if you see something uh, like a, uh, you know, big giant Y, it's probably a, could be a PVC or it's a giant QRS complex. So how many are there? Eight, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, I think I counted real quick. So there's about 18 of those QRS complexes across there. So maybe there's 17, I don't know. So there's 18. The point is, it's very fast. It's a very fast rate. Very fast, way too fast for the six second strip. And that means about 180 beats a minute. Now what's the rhythm? What's the rhythm? Looking across all of those peaks there, it's pretty regular. It's pretty regular. But is it regularly, is it, is it a regular rhythm or is it irregularly irregular? Well, it's irregular because there's no P, P to P and R to R in synchrony because you can't see a P to P. 
But what there is, is it's doing the same thing the whole time. It literally looks the same all the way across. And that makes it's doing the same thing over and over, so it's irregularly regular, or regularly irregular, however you want to put it. I always say those, um, uh, and I swap, swap the words, so it means the same thing. So anyway, look at P waves. There's none here. There's no P waves. Um, there's no there's no wee P waves present. You can't see anything. You see nothing but giant ventricular re, um, contractions because of these giant QRSs. The PR interval, of course, then means it's absent, and the QRS here is giant. So where's the QRS? Are there more than three boxes in between all of this? Yes, there's five, six, there's seven boxes of QRS in between here. So seven times four is 28, so 0.28 seconds of a, um, of a uh, QRS complex. It's very wide tachycardia. Wide tachycardias are often ventricular tachycardia is usually what it means. What do I do with this rhythm? What's the treatment here? Give them a hug, right? Just give them a hug. So the first thing you want to do is always, if you see a rhythm like this, check the patient. Um, check the patient. And what do you need to do to check the patient for? You need to check their pulse. Uh, because you can have ventricular tachycardia and be talking, walking just fine. Now, you can't do that for very long, but you can do it. Um, and that's what's, that's what's really important. Um, it doesn't work forever, but you can do it. Um, and that's, that's right. Um, you know, you can see that uh, um, definitely the important thing is um, that it, it, it's, um, you've got to check for that pulse. Because if they don't have a, you, you, the ACLS algorithms with this one, this is just a trick question that always pops up. Um, it's a big um, paramedic, nursing, medical school, all of them. What's the first thing you do? Check the patient. One, because it's easy to, you know, look like it's, they have VTAC if the patient is moving, if they're on the monitor. Number two, um, pulseless VTAC is treated differently versus um, VTAC without a pulse. If you don't have a pulse, you need CPR and, and um, defibrillation. If you have a VTAC with a pulse, you have to be cardioverted. So you need to be electrically cardioverted synchron um, using a synchronous cardioversion, meaning it uh, just works differently. So I hope you know the difference of those. Um, so I just got those three different um, differences here of what the things you need to do differently. I'm not going to go over it in big detail because I am running way behind. Um, so for polymorphic VTAC, it's just different. Now this is where you have torsades de point, um, and I'm sure I butchered that French name, but um, uh, is de point, uh, uh, and uh, torsades is what we call it. Polymorphic VTAC. Well, what does polymorphic mean? That means it's changing. Um, it's multiple changes in ventricular tachycardia. But let's not skip the process. What's the rate? Super fast at the end, right? What's the rhythm? Well, it's irregular, and it's irregularly irregular. Now, what was the other irregularly irregular rhythm that we had? Atrial fibrillation, right? Well, this one also is irregularly irregular. Polymorphic VTAC. Now, polymorphic VTAC, look for those P waves. No P waves. Is it junctional? No, just VTAC. I mean, it technically is a type of junctional, but it's it's uh, it's VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. PR interval is gone, but reason it's VTAC is we look at that QRS interval and it's wide. Every single one of these ugly QRS complexes are really wide. I mean, if you you could put your whole thumb in there if you had tiny thumbs. Thank goodness I don't have tiny thumbs. All the way across here, you can see um, you can see the big giant. Um, big giant wide QRS complexes. So you can see that's greater than 0 0.12 seconds or 0 0.10, either way, three boxes big. What do we worry about this? Well, polymorphic VTAC is uh, often torsades de pointism, can be caused by several different things. It can be caused by, um, there's a conduction defect that can cause torsades. There's um, R on T phenomenon can cause torsades. But what's important to know about this is that it it needs immediate um, uh, defibrillation, right? These patients are in big trouble. Now, you could have a bout of this, a short paroxysmal bout, but remember what we know about anything that's paroxysmal? You need to be worried about it. Um, so these patients usually have a, an impending cardiac arrest, or th well, this is cardiac arrest, but um, you know, they usually it doesn't go well after this. So we need to make sure we're worried about these. What's the medication we give people with this? What, what's the medication? Hmm, if there was only a medication that relaxed muscles. Ooh, yeah, I don't know. I just can't think of it, right? These patients are often going to be given magnesium, right? They're going to end up getting magnesium to, um, to calm the muscles down, especially because they're very irritated. Just like any time something's fibrillated, it's just twitching all over the place. Twitch, 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 fibrillating. 
fibrillatory waves. Now, um, oh, I already got this. I already kind of talked about the slides. I'm going to skip. Oh, maybe I didn't. Yeah, I did. Sorry. Now, the next one I want to talk about is um, ventricular fibrillation. So ventricular fibrillation, this is something I just want you to really um, not just guess every time you just see a squiggly line, you just guess V-fib. Please don't do that um, because it's pretty easy to be able to tell. Um, let's look at the rate here. What's the rate? I can't tell the rate, Kendall. That's absolutely right. Great answer. What's the rhythm? It's a bunch of chaotic mess. I can't tell. Absolutely right. Good answer. Where are the P waves? Look, what am I, a magician? I don't see any P waves. What's a PR interval? This is not funny. Um, and that's right. You, there's no, nothing is discernible. But what's important here is, is that there is nothing discernible at all, ever. There's no discernible pattern. Now, when I look back, if I go backwards and look differently at polymorphic VTAC, look at these giant, beautiful waves in here. I mean, these are, these are beautiful, giant VTAC waves. VTAC waves always look like this. Well, not always. They can be a little shorter. I mean, and, and I think they get upset when they're the shorter ones. They're, they usually look like these, these waves right here, these short ones, these little short, fat ones, or these big, beautiful, tall ones. And that's not a discrimination joke against short, fat people. I was... I'm short and fat. Anyway, the point is, I'm going to get so many hate comments for this, so I guess it's a good thing it's my last uh, Picmonic webinar today, huh? I guess. Um, the point is, there's no discernible pattern whatsoever. It's literally just, just you know, it's quivering all over the place. It's not doing any kind of, if I was to isolate this and throw it into a normal rhythm, it's nothing that would look like anything of a QRS complex, right? is not really anything that I can tell. And that's absolutely what is important. Now, as you go through this, um, and you look at this, it's like, well, what's the difference between a, this and AFib? Well, this is not a, atrial fibrillation because atrial fibrillation is usually very, um, very short, very fine waves, whereas ventricular fibrillation is a lot of larger waves. Look at the isometric line. It literally goes all the way, well, I can't move my cursor all the way across very well, but it's literally if a beautiful line all the way across the middle, and there's literally deflections above and below. The atrial fibrillation is just going to be little tiny deflections above because those are P waves which go above the isometric line. This is going above and below, but not in giant, beautiful waves, and it's very chaotic. There's no pattern. That's ventricular fibrillation. Now, there's a difference. Um, one of the things of, we, we do call this sometimes coarse V-fib, which is what, we, what I just showed you. And then there is something technically called fine ventricular fibrillation, which is literally just a whole bunch of nothing all the way across here. You may see people um, sometimes, uh, you know, treat this like an uh, asystole rhythm or whatnot, um, or try to call asystole fine V-fib and, and shock it. Um, I, I think that's a debatable thing. And, you know, this is fine V-fib, debatably. Um, and that's just where it's because it's not as tall. Now, the last one, asystole, A means without in medical terminology. One of the biggest things you need to learn in medicine is making sure you know medical terms so you can get all of this stuff correct. A means without, systole means uh, systole, so con the contraction without, without contraction, cardiac standstill. So what happens? Well, there's nothing, the end, we're done, right? There's the, what's the rate? There's no rate. Now, there may be P waves there. That's what's really important. You could have a systole and you could still have some P waves in here. Maybe there's just one little blip of a P wave. And that's one of the biggest things I struggled with when I when I first became a paramedic was uh, really being able to say, okay, well, what's the deal here? You know, being able to, uh, you know, there's still electrical activity. We should do something. Well, it's still asystole, unfortunately, because there's still electrical firing that may be happening in the atria, which could cause, um, you know, um, uh, atrial depolarization, but the heart may not actually be responding. So there's nothing absolutely dependable. Well, there's no, um, nothing going on. And that is asystole, um, and that's really um, all you have to know about that. I think it's the easiest one to know because it's just nothing, right? Here's a good example of our P wave asystole. So there's still a, a, an electrical activity firing at the SA node, but there's nothing going on elsewise. It's all done, went to sleep, and it's just gone. P wave, and there's nothing else, and that's what you need to know. One really important one, and don't you miss this trick, is pulseless electrical activity. P-E-A, right? It really, look at this rhythm. What's the rhythm here? This is beautiful. What's this person's pulse rate? Uh, pulse rate's zero. 
But the heart rate, the electrical heart rate is measured and it's probably, let me, what is it, 120? I don't know. It's beautiful. It's, it's a good, nice, beautiful rate. But the thing of it is, is you may have electrical activity in the cardiac monitor, but the patient may actually not have a pulse. That's where you always need to make sure you have that rule of check your patient, treat your patient, not the monitor, um, because this one could get you in trouble. Um, I don't see beautiful PEA that often, maybe more than once in my entire life. Um, that's like at a rate of like 50 um, that I thought was sustainable for life. But that was just because there were so many drugs given that the electrical activity I felt like had to at least be going on. Um, but then fortunately the heart muscle just wasn't responding. So here's our same uh, review of going over what you need to know. Follow this same process. Just do it. What's the rate? Is it slow? Is it regular? Or is it fast? Um, is it, and what, what's the rhythm doing? Is it doing the same thing over and over? Or is it just doing a bunch of crap all over the place? What's the P waves? One before every QRS is the most important. And then of course, each one, they need to be upright and consistent. They need to look the same all the way across. What's that PR interval? Less than 0.2 seconds. Super important to make sure that PR interval is less than 0.2 seconds. And then looking at the QRS last, which is depending on what book you look at, it's 0.10 to 0.12 seconds or less, or three small block boxes. If you see in things that are wide QRSs, those are usually ventricular rhythm, uh, ventricular arrhythmias, um, and that's just what you know. And as uh, I think Jack mentioned earlier, we give after after any kind of arrhythmia, ventricular arrhythmia, after the fact, we usually give lidocaine, and that's right. So guys, um, that's all we have in here for our um, webinar today. And then you can um, also sign up, and you can just message us straight from our site. In the back background, we've got Marley, who is our um, who is our uh, master nursing scholar, who also has been answering lots of your guys' questions on YouTube as well as GoToWebinar. But other than that, guys, um, we appreciate it. And as always, good luck studying. So that completes our pre-recorded webinar on ECGs. In this last part, we learned about the eight pigmonics that cover adenosine, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, venous thromboembolism assessment, venous thromboembolism interventions, heparin, warfarin, calcium channel blockers, and magnesium. Go learn these topics now at pigmonic.com or on the iOS or Android app. Just click the playlist link below this video that covers all 18 pigmonics that were covered in this three-part series and go ace that next exam. This is Nurse Marley wishing you happy studying.